Uh, my name is Dan Buckley. I'm the fire director for the National Park Service. I work here in Boise, Idaho at the National Interagency Fire Center. And how long have you been in this position? I've been in this position about 19 months. I worked here previously for eight years at the National Interagency Fire Center and then went to be a park superintendent for three and a half years at Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve in South Central Idaho and then uh, this job came open and I applied and it lured me out of a great job at Craters of the Moon. Was there anything during your first month or so in this position that surprised you about the job? Well, I got here in July 2015 and uh, I'm a member of the National Multi-Agency Coordination Group and if you remember back to the 2015 fire season that's right about when things heated up and uh, so yeah it was a uh, baptism by fire. <laughs> that group just had a meeting earlier today right? Yeah we went over the current fuels and weather conditions and we also talked about a few of the fires that are ongoing in the geographic areas how, what we can expect as far as uh, predicted fire behavior, fire occurrence in those geographic areas of the country, kind of get an outlook of where we are with resources, where they're located, how many air tankers we have available, those kind of things. A lot of pre-season planning, even though we are in fire season in parts of the United States already. Is there any one area that, that is very important to you that you would like to make a special emphasis for yourself or the program? Well. I want to continue the Park Service's use of fire to help restore ecosystems and protect communities. Um, I started out my career, Bill, as a hotshot. I was on a hotshot crew for 16 years. And, uh, you know, towards the end of those 16 years, I was working a lot of fires, putting them out, going, asking myself, why are we putting these things out when they're doing nothing but good? They're cleaning up all the fuels. They're uh, allowing more sunlight to penetrate to the forest. And um, so I moved from hotshot crews to fuels management, worked in fuels management for, um, in various capacities for uh, probably 10 more years until I, I left to do the park superintendent job. Which hotshot crew were you on for 16 years? I worked on the Arrowhead hotshot crews based in Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park. And uh, you know, we did a lot of interagency fire for sure as a hotshot crew. But we also did a lot of project work, and uh, I got interested in prescribed burning as a hotshot crew captain. I got my Burn Boss 2 certification and started doing prescribed burns right around uh, the Grant Grove area, Sequoia National Park, right close to where our station is. And, uh, you know, I like to think that a lot of the work I did back there in the mid 90s, early 90s, before I left the hotshot crew, helped them out last. 2015 fire season when the rough fire burned right up against Grant Grove and a lot of the fuels treatment that I helped to do and others that followed me continued uh, really helped preserve the sequoia trees in that area as well as the community of Wilsonia and the park uh, community of Grant Grove. Do you think that over the next few years the federal wildland fire agencies will implement the technology to allow our fire supervisors to know the real-time location of the fire and fire resources? Yeah, we're um, working on that. Um, uh, you know, unmanned aircraft systems are probably going to revolutionize our business. And we're starting to see those deployed on fires this year by firefighters who are trained to become UAS pilots. And uh, the BLM is moving in that direction ahead of the other agency. They're training 75 pilots. And next week, they're going to do a demonstration of what they can do with them. Uh, a lot of private vendors are interested in that, a uh, number of them to, you know, provide uh, both real-time camera shots and infrared shots. Uh, I talked to a vendor just two weeks ago who wanted to introduce a tethered UAS that would fly above a fire engine or a hotshot crew truck coming into a fire. That would be on a 1,500-foot tether that could feed them real-time information, and at the, you know, so there's a lot of things going on. They're also starting to use the unmanned aircraft systems for aerial firing. We had a demonstration in Homestead uh, National Monument last 
last year, the University of Nebraska developed one that could carry 25 of what we call ping pong balls, uh, spherical ignition devices. And uh, they, that proved to be pretty successful. And that, you know, 25 ping pong balls it doesn't get you a lot of fire, but it's a start. So another vendor has developed a new aerial firing technology that instead of using ping pong balls, uses tablets, much like you see an Alka-Seltzer tablet in an aluminum foil pack. Same thing, but he can carry 500 of those tablets in a UAS. So that's starting to increase the ability of those things to do firing. We don't have to put people in the air with a, a, a ignition device, aerial ignition device. We don't have to have a piloted helicopter. We can do all that through UASs. So we're just now starting to understand, as is you know, uh, private industry, all the uses for UASs. And, it really is going to revolutionize what we're able to do in wildland fire. The airline was training 75 pilots. I assume then that they must have a lot of UASs. Yeah, these are small UASs, you know, four or five pound UASs, the kind that hobbyists use. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have a, something like a Go camera, a GoPro camera on them that they can get up in the air and, you know, go scout fire before they drive up a canyon and to have a good look at what they're about to enter into. They can use that, you know, uh, to, w I mean, we're limited by our imagination at this point. We're gonna see a time coming up where we're gonna have UASs that are, have repeaters aboard them. And so we'll have a repeater above the fire at all times that we can talk and bounce our radio signals off. Um, it's just, it's, it's gonna, Already we're starting to explore, uh, we did a demo last year here in Boise exploring uh, full-size helicopters, K-Max helicopter that is unmanned and can fly cargo loads and do bucket drops. And uh, just think what that'll do for us. We can fly that helicopter with a pilot during the daylight hours like we do now, but instead of sitting that, pilot, that helicopter down all night in the dark, we can fly that thing at night doing bucket drops our delivering cargo, um, it's gonna it's gonna be amazing. You know, we're a few years off from that, but we are starting to explore that. Some of the systems that will be used this year will any of those transmit real time video down to firefighters on the ground? Yeah, I'm not sure of the technology. I, I haven't actually sat through a demo of them. There will be one here next Monday, out just a little bit southwest here of Boise or they're gonna show what these things can do. But uh, yeah, it, it will eventually be, if not already, it will be real-time stuff. And that technology, not only is it available now, and it's not terribly expensive either when you're using a drone that costs $1,200 or $2,000, but so that takes care of the, once we can transmit that live imagery down to the ground, that takes care of the knowing half of what I, I call them the the holy grail of wildland firefighter safety, the location of real-time location of the fire and the real-time location of the firefighters. So once we get that video in real time down to the ground, that's half of it. What about knowing the real-time location of firefighters? Yeah, you know, th that technology exists for sure. And I just talked to a vendor on Monday that is developing a system that will allow us to track firefighters with their cell phones. The cell phones already have the GPS location capabilities, and so they've developed a system that, um, that will be able to track them. So we'll get their IP address off their cell phone. We'll be able to label that person or that resource like Engine 2 or uh, Hotshot Crew Arrowhead and uh, put a real, real label on a map that we can watch from ICP and uh, be able to track folks' resources on the fire. The other capability it has is we can establish a geofence. So as they're carrying their cell phone and they enter an area that we've identified as dangerous, you probably don't want to go in there, it looks like the fire is headed that way, it'll actually trigger an alarm on their phone to tell them, hey, you just hit, you just hit a spot you probably shouldn't be in. Get the hell out. That's yeah. Shifting gears here, uh, if you were meeting a brand new ICT-3 incident commander at Type 3 that had just received his red card for that position, fully qualified, what is one thing you would like for that new ICT-3 to know? Well, 
The one thing every firefighter should know is safety of firefighters and the public is the first priority. And so keep your people safe is probably the best piece of advice I ever got as a new supervisor on a hotshot crew. So um, that, that really is the key. And how do you keep your people safe? Well, you get your own situational awareness and your own experience in education. Pay attention in your training classes. Pay attention to those stories firefighters tell each other, you know, in fire camp or out on the line when you happen to meet up with them. And start building those slides so you can recognize those instances um, and apply appropriate solutions to problem, uh, problem areas you may face. I mean, that really is key that we take care of our people and uh, take care of ourselves, keep ourselves healthy and the public healthy. How many large air tankers do the federal agencies need? <laughs> you know, um, that's a good question. And right now, uh, the last couple of years, and it's ongoing, we're doing an aerial fire use effectiveness study, and the Forest Service is sponsoring that, where we're trying to determine the effectiveness of aircraft, um, what sizes work best, what, whether it's a fixed wing or rotor wing. And so we're trying to get the data to say what would be the most effective aviation fleet we should have. Uh, right now, we don't have that data. Um, I can tell you uh, when firefighters ask for aircraft, we try to get them to them, but we don't always have enough available. For sure, those Type 1 helicopters are one of the things that we usually run short of because uh, I know from my experience of being a firefighter on the line, that was the most effective piece of equipment I used. Uh, pinpoint drops, pretty, pretty big capability as far as either water or retardant delivery, right where we needed it. Looking 10 years down the road, what kind of major changes or any changes would you like to see made in the federal wildland fire management organizations? You know, with fire seasons getting longer, there's two things I'd like to see. With fire seasons getting longer, the seasonal workforce isn't working for us. Um, for federal firefighters, seasonal firefighters, we can hire them for 1,039 hours, about six months of the year. And now that our fire seasons are getting longer, we're, we're finding that we need uh, additional time with those firefighters or additional firefighters. So it's uh, something we want to, something that probably needs to change because the, the old model of having seasonal firefighters worked uh, pretty well, but when we get something like happened in the southern area last year, most of our seasonal firefighters in the western United States were laid off. So we had to rely on our permanent firefighters and our permanent less than full-time firefighters to meet some of the order needs that the southern area had. The other thing I'd add is, uh, the other thing I'd change I'd like to see is defensible space, that homeowners, property owners take that seriously and get ready for fires, because it's not a question of if a fire is going to happen, it's a question of when. How many firefighters will the Park Service have this year? Park Service will have about 500 full-time equivalents. So um, we're, you know, that includes seasonal firefighters. So some of those, um, not can't give you an exact number because a lot of that depends on how many we're able to hire and uh, what we have budget for. So. Um, we'll have about 500 FTE that we're funded for, we know that. We haven't really had a problem with uh, attracting a workforce. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I did it when I was, worked my way through college as a seasonal firefighter. It was a great job um, for me. Um, and so we still have a, a interest. There's still interest out there to work in the woods. Um, it's a different breed that's coming up. I mean. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, didn't grow up on a ranch, didn't grow up uh, in a farming community, so it's a little different skill set that we're attracting. Has the federal hiring freeze affected your hiring this year? Um, you know, we, we didn't uh, because we were pretty rapid in getting an exemption, so it really didn't affect us that greatly. The number of firefighters you have in this year, is that any different from the number you had last year? No, we're, you know, we're right about where we were last year. Um, we have had a decrease, though, in the last seven years. Um, 
We at one point were about 640 FTE, now we're down to about 500, 530 FTE, so there has been a reduction. A few weeks ago I saw a video clip of the new Secretary of the Interior, Ryan Zinke. He was at Yellowstone and he was speaking to employees there and it appeared to be an unscripted extemporaneous talk he was giving and in the one or two minute clip I saw he, he mentioned that he was aware of the allegations of sexual harassment that had occurred at Yellowstone and he emphasized to the employees that uh, that was not acceptable and it was a priority for him. What is the Park Service doing in light of some of those sexual harassment allegations? Well, certainly it isn't appropriate behavior, either sexual harassment or a hostile work environment. And so I can't speak for all the Park Service, but I know in the wildland fire community, we're emphasizing that folks create a welcoming work environment, welcoming to all, and um, pointing out the fact that it's the right thing to do. Um, I have three or I have two daughters, and they're about the age where they want it. they're interested in going into fire. I would want them to be treated respectfully, and that's what we're asking people to look through that lens. What if that's your daughter, and how would you treat that person? Um, same with you know uh, people of different backgrounds. We need to treat them respectfully. A diverse workforce really adds to the amount of thinking that we can do. Everyone has a different background, everyone has a different history, and the, the things they can bring to the table with those different backgrounds and history is just going to make us a more well-rounded organization. So, you know, in fire management, we're uh, in the process of, we for the last year and a half, we've had a work group that's been working on, okay, what can we do to improve the work environment in Park Service Fire? And we recognize there's a there's a, a imbalance in the gender and ethnicity of our work group. And so we're, the, our solution is to create an environment that anyone would want to come and work in and be welcomed in that environment and be able to thrive. So that's how we're kind of tackling that problem, that issue. Picture, if you will, a wildland urban interface community. There's a buildup of fuel in the, in the wildland outside the, the structures. And it obviously needs to be treated somehow. And you were talking to a homeowner who is afraid of prescribed fire. They worry that the prescribed fire will get away. They've heard of prescribed fires getting away and damaging private property. But something has to be done. What would you tell that homeowner? Um, it's not a matter of if a wildfire is going to burn. It's a matter of when. And if we stand back and do nothing, then we're going to increase the chances that there's going to be an uh, unfavorable outcome. Um, for that particular homeowner, I mean, I've dealt with those in, uh, folks in the past in my field jobs, and it's a matter of showing them what can be done, uh, helping to increase the amount of protection we can put around their house. Uh, I mean, there's only so much we can do to reassure them that hey, we've got this, um, and, and granted, there have been some bad outcomes, but if you consider all the prescribed burning that all the agencies do every year, there are very few negative outcomes in those.